Last summer, I did a video recording with my friend Ben Mosher. Ben is someone that I've worked with in a variety of contexts and also someone who's been a sort of mentor to me about the topic of strategy. In this video, I put together an image that's a sort of mind map of strategy and the different techniques and tools and frameworks that Ben has taught me and exposed me to over the years. And I asked Ben about what strategy is, what these different tools are, and how they all relate to each other. Which tools do you use when, and what are they all good for anyway? So that's what we discussed in this video. The image that I'm discussing and that Ben is looking at isn't visible in the video, so I'm posting it in the notes below the video and so that you can look at it as well. And we hope that you enjoy this video and benefit from it and would love to hear any thoughts or questions or feedback that you have about it. I really wanted to talk to you about strategy and the different models that you use and how they fit together. Um, you've been essentially a mentor to me in learning about strategy and you've been the root of everything that I've learned about this topic in the last few years. And you've been extremely generous with your time sharing what you know with me. And um, I've been lucky enough really from that gift to take it and you know, push the edges with you and like find new territory and explore new ideas. And uh, that's been really beautiful and precious to me. And uh, I realized that over the course of our relationship, I've been asking you the, pretty much the same question over and over again uh, in different forms at different times for different reasons. But um, it's a question that I think would be useful for the world to hear your answer to. Um, and so I thought it would be nice to sit down and talk about this question and hope that it would be a benefit to other people as well. Um, and the question is basically this, which is, um, you know, and, and I'll turn this on you in a second, but uh, from what I've learned from you about strategy, you make use of a number of different models and tools and frameworks that uh, you know haven't necessarily been related before uh, that were developed maybe independently some of them in connection some of them not in connection and you sort of move fluidly between these different methods and tools and kind of have a sense of what tool to use when what's useful what's not useful. And, um, you know, again and again, when we've actually collaborated on projects, I've seen that things go better for having you involved and for the tools that you use. Uh, you ask questions that push things in useful directions. You make tweaks, adjustments that uh, cause even seismic shifts in the way that things are being approached. And it seems like this sort of meta knowledge of what tools to use when is extremely valuable and maybe even more valuable than any one of the particular tools that you tend to use. Um, so with that kind of context, like, I guess I'd be curious to ask you just first off, like totally broad level, how do you currently see what strategy is and what, what it encompasses? Uh, just top level, but also just a hint of what, what it is. It doesn't have to be like a huge, all encompassing definition or something. <laughs> yeah. Let, let me uh, pull a couple books off the shelf and <laughs> uh, outline for you my thesis. Um, yeah. So strategy, I, I feel kind of silly, like trying to answer that question because I've been on the earth for at the time of this recording, uh, something like 29 years and I feel like maybe I'll have a good idea sorted out of what strategy is in maybe another 30. <laughs> but um, right now, as best as I can tell, and as best as I can tell is the best I can offer because um, my, my focus tends to be on like pragmatism and pragmatic action. I, um, I used to really like theories. And I used to really like precise language. And then um, it occurred to me that um, you, like you have to, have to actually do stuff with those theories. Like it's not enough to know. You have to enact that knowledge through doing. Uh, 
So um, the, the pragmatic version of strategy that I think exists is, has a lot to, well, it has a lot to do with intentionality. So being intentional about things, uh, what decisions you make, how you make them, um, how you carry those decisions out. And I would like to think that being intentional means you are striving towards some larger intent, lar some, some greater kind of vision of the way that the world could be. Um, and those outcomes, um, the way that those futures might occur um, are, I mean, for lack of a better word, favorable. And favorable, I think, is an interesting thing because like, as soon as you start looking at any one of these words, you're like, does that mean favorable for me? Does that mean favorable for us? And you start asking really interesting questions really quickly. Why do we exist? What futures do we imagine that are preferable? And I think a lot of times, um, it's a temptation to sort of skip that line of thinking because of how hard and difficult and scary it is, but also to fall back on simplistic versions of that. And I think part of strategy is staying with that for a bit and really struggling with it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The definition that you give sort of uh, cautiously, and then also the questions that you're wrestling with about what it means. Um, and this brings up for me that one of the things I've really noticed about working with you is that you have a very broad definition of what a favorable outcome is. So it's not just for the company that we happen to be working with or just for the project that we happen to be working on, but it's also for all of the stakeholders, for everyone who's impacted um, within the group and also outside of the group, or even for a very large populace like humanity or the planet or something like that. I really feel like you bring that to the table of how can as many people as possible be incorporated into and benefited from the relevant work. Um, so that's something that I've always appreciated about working with you. Um, so uh, to prepare for this, I made kind of a list a little bit with your help of different models that I've seen you use or seen you talk about some of which I'm familiar with, some of which I'm not familiar with, and uh, made kind of a visual map of them. Uh, how that, and I'm curious to just ask you about them, what they are, how they relate, uh, and in particular, when you use which models. Like, when is this one relevant? When is that one relevant? When do you use a hammer? When do you use a saw? Uh, that's kind of easy to tell in the physical domain with carpentry, not so easy to tell with strategic frameworks and models and you are very skilled at this. So I'm always curious to ask you about it. And I think others will be curious as well. Um, so I'll just share my screen now and kind of show you the uh, tool that I, or the <clears throat> map that I made. Um, can you see this okay? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so just for people who are listening, there's a, uh, a diagram with a bubble in the middle that says strategy and then a number of tools connected to that bubble that we'll be discussing. And then uh, Ben, you said you could share this in the show notes later, correct? Yep, that's where we'll put it, so yeah. Great. Um, so I don't know, there's maybe what, like 12, 15, or so things here, is that about right? I don't know, it's been a while since I counted anything on purpose. Me too, <laughs> I spend half my time meditating and counting is something that can go <laughs> when you do that. Anyway, um, <laughs> but in any case, there's a, a sort of small finite number of things here and just taking this in, seeing the different words and phrases here, which you know about, uh, I'm curious if you have any like reactions to seeing this image or what's there and what's not there and that kind of thing. I think the first feeling that I get from looking at all these things all at once is kind of just how interconnected everything is. Mm -hmm. 
and like maybe so so this is a very nice kind of presentation of a lot of different things that are related to and connected to strategy and i think i would definitely think of all of them as tools that are useful in the questions that strategy asks i would also say that in a strange way it's almost like you have to use a different filter to look at the same information where every single one of these is related to all the others in, in differing kind of ways. And so it's almost like a, a kind of lattice or a, like an interwoven, hopefully not a mess, but, <laughs> but in a way it's kind of like a mess and it's a mess that can be traversed. Like I might start out thinking with one set of frames and then find an adjacent frame that seems to fa- feel more appropriate or feel better. Um, and part of what we've discussed a little bit before is sometimes the way that I navigate which model to use is not some very like clean set of heuristics about which model to use when. Although I'm sure if you, um, excuse me, I'm sure if you if you sat me down in a corner and asked me to create his heuristics for all of these, I could. I'm just not sure that I actually think of them that way. I think it's more... Um, I have almost like a, a, a bit of a cheat code where it's almost like anxiety driven sense making. <laughs> like I can feel it in my body whenever I can't make sense of something. And um, in a way that actually ends up being really powerful because I can shift frames, try it on almost like a uniform and go, Oh, okay. Th- this frame feels better for this situation. And I actually see what actions I can take now and that feel, I feel relief. Like I actually feel relieved from that kind of moment of realization. So that's, that's my first reaction to the image. So although you could sort of abstract out like rules that you could record or something like that, that feels more artificial. And in fact, it's something that you've learned to do with kind of the sense making that happens in the body. Yeah, I think so. Like a lot of times if I'm feeling conflicted about something that may lead me to, so one of the the items on here is paradoxical dichotomies. Mm -hmm. Um, So just paradox and and pairs of opposites. And what I've learned from reading um, like uh, deciphering Sun Tzu by Derek MCUM is um, things like how to do how to use paradoxical logic and how opposites play off of each other and in fact kind of lead to each other Mm -hmm. um which has a whole like broad sweeping set of like implications but then conflict might also just mean that i have an unlisted assumption and so maybe i'll switch from a mode of paradox to using something from the logical thinking process like maybe an evaporating cloud diagram um or something like that in order to make sure that I've accounted for all the assumptions that are um, implicitly being made in the situation. So it, it kind of skips around like that. Um, so yes, it, it's interesting how it gets traversed, I think, in a given situation. Definitely. Um, well, just kind of getting into some of the object level things. I mean, you've sort of uh, built a lot of your work that's happening right now around Wardley mapping. And I know you've kind of compared it to duct tape in the past, uh, where it's like, it's a good thing for uh, sticking things together. Uh, That's duct tape is generally useful in a lot of physical object situations in a similar way. Wardley mapping is like as good a place to start as any with a lot of uh, strategy things. And I'd be curious to hear you talk about that and like when wordly mapping is useful, maybe some edge cases where it's not so useful that would make you pull for some of these other frames. Um, just that direction in general. Yeah. I think maybe uh, <laughs> wordly mapping is to Kinevin as duct tape is to WD-40. Not mm-hmm, necessarily mm-hmm. in their individual function, but in their maybe like tacit ubiquity in the toolbox yeah. of my mind. Um, Kinevin is something that I think I'd like to try practicing more deliberately, but, um, I I will say most of my time is spent thinking about things in terms of worthy mapping. And the reason that those two things are so 
I guess, fundamental is because they, I mean, they try to approach fundamental kinds of understandings. Um, Kinevin is an ontological framework. It's about the way that you be <laughs> or the way that things be. Um, mm -hmm. and, it, and it helps you make sense of that in terms of whether or not cause and effect is um, knowable, uh, the ordered versus unordered domains, and how, what that implies for the way that you should approach the circumstance. Like just if, if you were to get like the 80-20 on a, like a Kinevin sort of approach to things, you could learn so much just by trying to notice before entering a situation whether or not cause and effect is largely predictable. And if it's not predictable, instead of trying to treat it like a machine and take it apart, you probe and see what happens and then respond to that. And, and that is just such a powerful kind of like basic dynamic that like changing your expectations of the situation means that you are not freaking out whenever something goes unexpectedly because you, you have another mode to switch into or you might have had that expectation that things might not have gone predictably in the first place and that's the game right like you, you become used to that kind of thing so you're less likely to become disoriented but like wordly mapping is more like modeling of systems that produce value and then over top of that you kind of layer this body of research about capitalism which seems to be the system that we're, we're all for the most part participating in and then it it asks you to think very carefully about what kinds of decisions you can make as a result of the new understanding that emerges from that and um, because of because of those things are so kind of fundamental, like worthy mapping actually does involve ontology. Um, and this body of research, which we seem to care about uh, with, with respect to capitalism, does help you make like interesting decisions. It does make you aware of certain kind of dynamics. Um, you know that the forces of supply and demand competition sort of are are enacting on you. Um, you can almost get away with, with framing any given problem as a problem that is mappable. And one of the probably first critiques that you could make of that is, well, not everything is really, not really everything ought to be viewed in the, through the lens of capitalism. And I, I would agree with that. But because a lot of the things you shouldn't view through the lens of capitalism, such as social good, or um, you know, really, really anything that's more about purpose than profit um, because those activities still take place inside a fabric that is permeated with capitalism, the implications that that has on your ability to carry those things out are so important that it's still useful to, to pay attention to those. So it, it really tries to get at some fundamental things and it's really not well formed how to use it. Which, which actually is an advantage in some ways because you can kind of go into the raw material, the pile of raw material of wordly mapping stuff and come out with a specific hammer and be like, ooh, this is a, sp a specific kind of conversation that we can have from this body of knowledge. And like a very quick example of that is um, probably one of the first things many people encounter when they start learning about the concept of evolution in wordly mapping is uh, so if things that are in different stages of evolution occur differently, have different characteristics, then that means we should treat them differently. And so suddenly we have a way of making sense of what we should build inside of our organizations, what we should buy and what should we, we should outsource. And that's just as important to a social good organization as it is to, um, someone trying to make a quick buck on wall street. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's a little oh, that's bit great. of navigating that space. Um, we could maybe explore counterexamples, maybe, where I wouldn't use worldly mapping. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. So part of what makes worldly mapping powerful is how, how it focuses on analysis of phenomena. And it like forces you to try to model the world and make sense of it in that way. 
but it takes a lot of lead up and a lot of work to actually get to a point where you have something that is uh, useful, I would say. Um, or at least it can feel that way. And so one of the, the reasons I might go somewhere else is if I just don't have time or if the people that I'm working with, <laughs> I really don't want to put them through um, a big kind of like learning exercise where they have to very rapidly adjust to a different frame. And so sometimes if I can't um, accomplish what we're doing with um, this big kind of almost unwieldy tool, I'll, I'll try to use something smaller. Um, and, and sometimes like almost at a force of habit, I, I don't use Wardley mapping by default mm -hmm. in order to prompt myself to try something else. And that way I never fall into like modeling as like the only way of knowing things or worldly mapping broadly as the only way of knowing things and the only way of interacting. Mm -hmm. So, but also sometimes the other tools have like really specific kind of uses. So like stop, start, continue is one of the things on this chart. And I mean, that's a really great tool for a conversation about almost like a retrospective kind of moment. Like we've been working on this thing and that's been going a certain way. How's that been going? Okay. All right. Um, what should we stop doing? Like what doesn't make sense to do anymore? What could we start doing? And what, what should we keep pretty much the same? Like, super helpful. And like, I, I know for a fact that my uh, comprehension of that tool is like probably super surface level, but like that makes it useful. And maybe later I can go learn more about it and apply it in new ways. But like, I'm not going to make a worthy map for that because I have 15 minutes. <laughs> so that's, that's maybe um, one of the kinds of like exceptions or kind of one of the ways that I almost avoid using any one tool as a default. Yeah, that makes sense. I, it seems like we're sort of proceeding in order of like generality or um, ubiquity, as you called it. Uh, are there any of these others that pop out as like useful in most cases? Yeah, I think so theory of constraints is on here, for example, mm -hmm. and that's a useful frame for thinking about almost anything in terms of flow. Uh, and, and basically one of the, One of the key things from that is any improvement that is not at the constraint of the entire system is basically an illusion. And while that was like primarily applied in manufacturing contexts, I find that useful even in just thinking. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things I'm working on right now is, is making a, a model of a space. And so there are a lot of different kinds of um, activities going into that. Everything from research to sketching to presenting things to others to producing video to sort of scale that presentation and looking at that entire process i can ask the, the question like where is the constraint on the the value that's flowing through this entire system and the value is ultimately how whatever it is that i'm working on helps other people and so every time i make a tweak to the model or spend too long researching instead of pr like pushing out what's already been researched and what's already been modeled, um, I actually deprive the world of delivery of that value. So that's kind of like one pretty generic thing. Another thing is um, the ideal present framework, which is something that uh, Jay Bloom has really made me think about. Um, and I think it has some basis in Russ Acoff's interactive planning and it basically says, um, uh, the, the way that Jabe would frame it, because he's a transition designer, is what is the mess that we're in right now? Like, what, what, what is good about what's happening to us right now? What's bad about what's happening to us right now? And if things play out the way that they are, like if we just let time pass, what's going to happen as a default outcome? And that's the projected mess. That's the, that's the, so if this is the current state, 
We're going to look forward into the future and think about the projected mess. And then what seems like an ideal future that we would prefer to happen instead of that projected mess? And then finally, we sort of locate ourselves back in the present and we ask, okay, given the current state, given the projected mess, given the ideal future, what could we be doing right now that would alleviate the problems of the present, avert the default sort of way that things would play out with the projected mess, and to start working towards an ideal future, like the one that we were thinking about. And so it's very much focused on now. And um, Jabe could probably explain this much better than I could, um, since seeing that as it's his framework. But I think the uh, idea is to extend what we consider to be the present um, and actually stop doing this thing called gap thinking. Uh, where we commit to some particular ideal future, work really hard to pursue it, and then about halfway through realize that we're failing and then devalue the present in order to push harder towards the future. And then we're nowhere because the world keeps moving on and our ideal future stops being the thing that actually we need to be doing now. And so we, we are aiming for the wrong thing by the time it plays out. So part of what ideal present design does is it enables you to dispose like it enables you to what's the right word way to say this ideal present design enables you to line yourself up to pursue something like an ideal future but continuously be pursuing the like whatever the ideal is tomorrow it's not that you're changing direction rapidly, but you're giving yourself lots of opportunities to integrate new conceptions of what the future could be and operate towards those from the present. So you'll work a little bit and kind of realize where you are and integrate that instead of making the future, the one future that is acceptable, the only possible outcome, and then immediately failing as soon as reality starts playing out. So anyway, I, I think that's another kind of universal thing Yeah, it seems to come pretty close to bordering on to uh, conditions, consequences, as I understand it. Does that seem connected to you as well? <laughs> you know, it does. <laughs> it does seem connected. Um, and conditions and consequences thinking is also something that I would consider to be potentially universally useful. Mm -hmm. And that's a juxtaposition between... Um, kind of like there's a, there's a very Eurocentric kind of model of strategy, which has to do with uh, means and ends. So you do things and you get results and everything is a plan and it's a causal chain that you just have to like make happen. So you mm -hmm. just go do it. And then as a comparison or as an opposite approach, conditions, consequences is, is like more gardening. And, and I think the idea is that you cultivate conditions that will inevitably produce consequences. Uh, it's more indirect. And Can you give an example so, of that? Yeah, if, if for example, you're raising a child, you're a parent, and every time there's a behavioral difference, between what you would ideally like your child to be doing and what they are doing in reality. If you try to force fully correct the behavior, every time that happens, you are using the means ends frame and you're only basically fighting symptoms in a way. Um, and that's not to say that means ends is always the wrong framework. There are many times where plans are useful or where causal chains are useful but there's a different way to look at the, at the problem space. You ask yourself, what kind of conditions would I need to create for my child to have the behavior that I would prefer? And 
you start to realize that you have to be very careful about how you think about that. I would like my child to be kind. What conditions would I need to cultivate to produce in my world, in this child's world, that would consequentially produce kindness? And you start to realize that there are a lot of ways that you are either creating conditions that produce kindness or diminishing conditions that produce kindness. And so maybe you start to realize that um, it's not discipline that's the problem. Like there, there, first of all, there is no one problem, but it's not just discipline. It could actually be the example that you're setting in the conversations that you have with others. It could also be the other people around the child who are setting examples. It could be whether or not certain kinds of media are being viewed by the child without an additional layer of, hey, let's talk about what just happened there. So there, there are ways that kindness is either being reproduced and expanded or diminished. And so what, what, what would you have to do in order for kindness to be the inevitable result? And you, you just have to start thinking one, two, three steps removed from the situation. And yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a really kind of messy example because I, I was about to go somewhere dark. So I'm going to back out of there. Yeah, that, the, the example makes sense. Um, you know, I can, I'm, I, hearing you say that, I imagined like uh, maybe a child says something mean to their sibling or something. And then you're like, well, if they're, if they, maybe they're hungry and if they're well fed, they'll be nicer to their siblings than if they're not hungry or something like that. Uh, does that kind of fit with what you're describing? Yeah, it does. And especially to the extent that you don't look at that one thing as being mm -hmm. the sole cause. Mm -hmm. That there's um, multiple factors or conditions for situations. Yeah, and there, there's no like magical causal chain. Mm -hmm. Like there's no like, oh, just fiddle these knobs and magically it will produce kindness. Mm -hmm. um, you could introduce conditions. Like what, 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 what would practicing kindness look like? Because one of the conditions could be, how can your child emulate kindness if they don't know what it looks like? Mm -hmm. If they don't practice it. So what conditions could you cultivate where they're basically practicing kindness regularly? And that's, that's only like one or two steps removed from mm -hmm. kindness itself. Mm -hmm. Then you go deeper and you kind of ask yourself more fundamental questions like, what would the conditions be for me to be able to create conditions for my mm -hmm. child to practice kindness every day? Well, well, I might need, I might need like an activity. Like I, I don't want to just have them say words that they don't believe. What kind of activity would enable them to practice kindness, which would then enable them to be kind? Wow. Wow. I think I that's like probably a totally different way of looking at things than most people are used to. And it's, it's like, uh, sort of opens up a lot of possibilities. I think we've kind of come at this from what is the most general thing on here. Um, and kind of talked about the most general tools. I'm curious about the other tools and I'm imagining that they're, far more specific and uh, limited to specific contexts. And so I'd be curious to ask you about it from the opposite direction of like, what is the most like context limited tool on here? Or what are some of the more context limited tools on here? And when would you use them in what situations? Hmm. Yeah, that, <laughs> that one's almost harder <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to think about. Um, yeah. It, like it's it's interesting because whenever I'm thinking about a space, I'm I'm almost 
subconsciously just eliminating all like a lot of tools all at once based on like i don't know it, it just it feels wrong for the context um and so i guess i'm trying to figure out which ones tend to get eliminated the most um it's interesting so multi-level perspective is it it feels like it's a pretty specific kind of tool uh and basically the idea of that is it's a it's a almost like market slash innovation modeling thing. Um, it thinks about landscape forces, like really long, like sort of standing kind of forces that are acting on a, a market. Um, you could think of it like regulatory change or just basically any sort of unexpected external force, like um, say coronavirus. Uh, and then it affects these things called regimes, which are like st stabilities of like compositions of, of different kinds of organizations, um, all that like kind of come together to fulfill some sort of purpose. Like you could say the automotive industry is a regime um, and it has like a common language and they talk about things a certain way and um, they are basically reacting at any point to sometimes these landscape forces that are sort of destabilizing the regime and then that kind of creates this opportunity for like niche innovations to sneak in and like kind of like enter the the during the disruption and then become part of the new stability when it restabilizes uh, and that's not a comprehensive thing but like it is very specific like a market kind of modeling like innovation focused tool um, and so like sometimes the concepts of like dynamic stabilities become useful in other cases and that's like a useful kind of thing to think about but yeah i i don't really pull that one out all the time <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um yeah and honestly the other one probably is um while commander's intent is like i i think intent in general is a useful thing the specific application of commander's intent in terms of like leadership is kind of um one that I don't go around talking about a lot, um, both because it's something that I'm not quite, um, like I'm not a CEO, I don't do a lot of that kind of work, but I do do a lot about like thinking about how people talk to other people about shared intent. Um, and commander's intent is really um, kind of focused on like a military foundation for uh, the, the the problem with the Eurocentric modeling of strategy, which is, plans do not survive contact with uh, the reality of the situation. So um, it's an interesting thing to think about. And there are some books on my shelf that I am waiting to one day read about it. But um, yeah, it's, it's probably a really specific tool. And I think, I think we talked, since we start, talked about um, stop, start, continue as well, I would probably put it in a, in a bucket of very specific kinds of tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that makes me curious to ask like, I mean, this is a trend that I've seen, you know, in myself learning these skills, but also hearing you report just now of um, even, at least it seems to me that even a surface level of comprehension of these tools can dramatically change how you look at things and empower you to behave differently. And you don't necessarily need to be a master of these tools to get value out of them. Yeah. And uh, in the same way, I feel like, you know, you could probably write like a PhD thesis or a really long book about each of these tools and how they relate and when you would use them and when you wouldn't use them. Uh, like you could go into great detail about that and like all of the times that you use them and all of the mistakes that you've made and all of the lessons that you've learned. Um, and that's the topic that I'm most interested in, but I would be curious, you know, since there's this theme of even a little goes a long way uh to have you kind of zoom out and look at all of these different topics and almost in like a lightning round see if you can you know constrain yourself to like five or ten minutes and see if you can just make an attempt at how all these things relate and when you use them when you don't use them uh from the big picture without needing it to be like the perfect final account that has every detail and every edge case or anything like that. But just for someone who's interested in rolling up their sleeves and learning about strategy, what would you say about all of these ideas and how they relate? 
no pressure, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just go, Ben. Just like 10 minutes, it has to be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can. I'll, I'll call it, kind of start in home turf, uh, Wardley mapping, and I'll kind of extend from there. So one of the related concepts that is taught uh, directly in Wardley mapping is doctrine. And this is like universal principles that you choose um, and, and the kind of framing is it's the way that you think about the world or the, or the, the principles that you choose to employ when thinking about the world or doing things in the world um, that you uh, take as for granted universally appropriate kinds of things. Um, so like, for example, uh, don't punch down. Like that's, that's, a, that's a heuristic that you can value as an organization. Uh, Simon Worley has a whole bunch of doctrinal kind of things that, that he shares. Things like, hey, maybe... Uh, remove duplication from the organization like uh, don't don't be biased about how you approach certain kinds of things try try to um, look to the external world first before reinventing the wheel uh, those are doctrinal principles that according to that frame are universally applicable and so i, I think you can invent your own for all circumstances um, and that's just an interesting thing to think about um, when you think about strategy there's a related concept to worldly mapping called Borea mapping, which Tashin has largely done uh, all the heavy lifting on adapting Samo Borea's work uh, through like a visual kind of model, kind of similar to how we do worldly mapping. And it's focused on uh, this idea behind like, is the great founder theory and great empire theory. Am I getting those right? Um, and roughly speaking, you think about how in every single sort of organizational unit. There is uh, an organization around a central power or uh, um, a pe like people or group, like a person or a group of people who have high power in that sort of organization. And then there are sort of concentric rings of relative power to that central power. So high, me medium, or I guess, high, mid, low power, and then out, which is not a part of the organization, not a part of that organizational unit. And um, you also get to talk about things like liveness or deadness. So whether or not you're able to do new things on like uh, spontaneously. So spontaneity, I think is a, a good way to describe that versus deadness, which is more like you follow the, the kind of script, the, the, the thing that you've always done. And both are valuable. Um, it turns out that in different contexts, both of those things are highly useful. Um, I see uh, in the diagram SWAT is on here. So strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But I think Toshin actually, you should maybe talk about the the re um, sort of shifting of those terms. Uh, what what does SWAT mean in the Borea context? Oh, it's the same thing. I mean, I gave it slightly different terms that made more sense to me, but it's the same model. But uh, as far as I can tell, and, and actually Simon says the similar thing, that if you actually have an understanding of the landscape, then tools like SWAT make much more sense than if they're just used out of context without really understanding the landscape. So if you understand the power dynamics in an organization, it's much more useful to know about different parties' strengths and weaknesses, what their goals are, what the possible traps that you could run into are in relation with them. Awesome. And then um, something related to Wardley mapping also is the OODA loop. Uh, Wardley mapping has this concept called the strategy cycle, which maps roughly to OODA, so absorb, observe, orient, decide, and act. And uh, this is a model for kind of decision-making and sense-making uh, that was created by um, Colonel John Boyd. And he has a, a much more complicated diagram, which... I'm still learning about and trying to understand, and I have folks in my life like uh, Ben Ford and others who, who are teaching me um, that sort of thinks about this not as just a, a simple cycle, but actually a lot of like really complicated interactions that are occurring. And roughly speaking, um, I think the idea is that uh, for me, it's helpful to notice that there's a difference between observing the world and orienting to it. Um, that's uh, two different things for me personally. And there, I can tell when I'm not oriented and when I'm disoriented and how confusing and frustrating that is, which means I can't make decisions, uh, which means every time I'm trying to make a decision, but I'm disoriented, um, you know, the loop gets longer. <laughs> um, so, so 
that's something that I, I kind of have like a very basic level of understanding and there are lots of good materials that you can read if you want something deeper. Uh, let's see, what have we not covered? Westrom typology is one that's on here that's really interesting. So uh, Westrom, the, the Westrom typology is from uh, a paper or a series of papers that explored this idea of organizational learning. And um, it's, it's a series of questions that are um, kind of phrased like, in my organization, such and such can such and such. And it's a basic kind of like evaluative framework for thinking about whether or not learning can happen inside the organization. Um, and it's, it's interesting how learning organization could be its own buzzword and, and all that kind of fun stuff. And, and there's uh, certainly books written about that kind of thing. Uh, it's interesting how few organizations actually manage to accomplish the, the kinds of things that are um, outlined as being desirable in these kinds of ideas. So mm -hmm. alliances, I think, are kind of related to Borea mapping in the sense that when, like, we need to be actively cultivating relationships in human systems, not just out of whoever we happen to interact with most by default, but with which kinds of people with which kinds of power we want to align ourselves with in order to produce uh, kind of the, the preferable futures that we would like. Um, and I will caveat that statement because that was probably somewhat jarring with something that I learned from you, Tashin, um, about the, the balancing and integration of wisdom, love, and power, and the, the trouble we get into when people without wisdom and love have power, and when people with wisdom and love don't have power. Uh, so I've, I've come to respect uh, seeking power as not a, uh, a reflexively bad thing to do, even though I, I still very much hesitate in doing it. Um, but having alliances, having connection is something that should be done deliberately, I think. Um, and so that, that is probably the short version of that, um, I would say. Then, let's see. So then there's a the logical thinking process. And this is pretty closely related to the theory of constraints. And the, the idea is, like, it's, it's a lot of um, logical trees and, and thinking frameworks that focus on different kinds of problems. And um, it, it's, it's pretty amazing, actually, just like how, how far you can go with a certain kind of um, frame of mind if you, if you take it. it it's, it's very much based on like necessary and sufficient thinking and uh, kind of what, what kind of basic assertions can you chain together in order to produce some sort of like full picture of a system. Uh, so one of, one of the logical thinking processes is like a current reality tree and the way that you make it is you write down a list of all the unambiguously bad things. They, they call them undesirable effects. Um, and then you try to connect them together to see which bad effects cause other uh, undesirable effects. And at the end, you end up with a, with a causal tree that tells you all your problems and how they're connected. So then you know where to focus your efforts to improve the system or make things better. Um, and there are, there are a couple others, like the, we mentioned the evaporating cloud uh, earlier, I think. Did we? We mm -hmm. did. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple other tools, like the evaporating cloud diagram, that focus on conflict. Uh, how, how do you resolve conflict? Well, it turns out a lot of times, despite how uh, much we've convinced ourselves that we know what the right answer is, uh, we actually haven't documented all of our assumptions. We don't know all the things that we're asserting to be true. They're not conscious, but we're, we're assuming that they're true and we're not consciously doing so. And so bringing them to the surface can help us find wiggle room in otherwise completely uh, unresolvable conflicts. So really an interesting set of theories on, on how that works. Um, and I've, I've certainly used those in, uh, I, I'll, I'll say I've used them, um, I don't like the phrase using things in anger so much, even though it's idiomatic, but like, I don't know what to replace it with. <laughs> I've, used, I've used the logical thinking process to, um, deal with some really careful 
concerning situations before and it, it's been very helpful. I'll put it that way. Then uh, finally, epistemic justice, which is a framing of how to think about issues of prejudice in terms of people's roles as knowers. And there are two basic kinds of epistemic injustice. Uh, there's um, testimonial injustice, which is basically when uh, someone is, um, th their credibility is diminished because of a prejudicial uh, thing, uh, because of prejudicial reasons. And then the other thing is hermene hermeneutical injustice, which is sort of, it's centered in a person's ability to make sense of their own experiences and express those experiences to others. Mm -hmm. And so like a quick example of a hermeneutical injustice is uh, sexual harassment um, of women, particularly in the workplace, um, before there were things like the Me Too movement, the, the way that people could make sense of experiences where they were sexually harassed um, and frankly, like worse, the way that they would make sense of those things um, was very different than the way that we, we would make sense of them now. Now we have a whole language to describe what happens. And um, as terrible as, as it is, having that language means that we can express those ideas to others and we can share those meanings. And then I think the result is we can take action and we can actually make meaningful progress in changing the way things work. So um, the idea of epistemic justice as opposed to epistemic injustice is, I think, in creating opportunities to boost others' credibility or to preserve their credibility um, or to enable them to make sense of their experiences and communicate those experiences, uh, to empower themselves to uh, express and, and describe those experiences as well. So in, in that sense, one kind of weird thought is like made, and this is something that Kat Swatel said uh, at Map Camp 2019 and kind of really is, has put me on this whole pathway is tools like Kinevan, tools like Wardly Mapping. And I think to, uh, in similar ways, a lot of the tools we've discussed today, those can be tools of epistemic justice, assuming that they help people understand their own experiences or assert their credibility um, or communicate their experiences to others. So that's roughly, uh, I think, the whole gamut of <laughs> weird ideas and interesting things to think about that are related to strategy. Wow. Wow, you did it. You Amazing. Did it. <laughs> uh, I guess having said all that, is there anything that you'd want to say to like close out what um, we've discussed and the big picture of strategy? You know, I think the thing that comes to mind most is the, <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, we didn't talk about anticipatory awareness. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, go on YouTube and search anticipatory awareness and there's a video for you. Um, I think what I want to say is this looks like a lot. And it would be, I think, a reasonable kind of first reaction to be overwhelmed by the sheer amount of these things. Um, I, I want to point out that this is the culmination of, of years of thinking and, and not just like learning for the sake of learning, but like it's the cheat code that I have. It's, it's the anxiety response to things not making sense and trying to make sense of things. So I have been, for better or worse, compelled um, to learn all of these things one by one. And so if, if any of these feel like they're resonant, I would say start by reading maybe a paragraph or two about them and see if you still feel that resonance. And if you do, go deeper and learn more. But there's no like wholesale like, this is how you have to make sense of strategy. Like there's nothing like that. Um, this is hopefully just an interesting way to be exposed to some new tools or some new ideas. And hopefully uh, it's something that we can learn together.
and share together um, either on Twitter or by email or what have you. Um, Tasha and I are both accessible uh, by those routes, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, so what, what are your final thoughts? Did we, did we perform the tour de force that you were hoping for? Absolutely. Um, and I think one of the big things I'm noticing from this conversation is just again, that a little goes a long way. And, um, you know, I think you certainly demonstrate a humility about these things of like, look, I don't know these things perfectly. I haven't read every book about these topics. And yet what I do know has been useful to me and helps me to do better things in the world than would happen otherwise. Um, so I would hope that people listening or watching would feel empowered to learn just a little bit about some of these things and that it would help them um, in their various projects, their various responsibilities to uh, do something better than might happen otherwise. Yeah, I, I think the uh, there's always a danger of naively understanding something and then doing it wrong. Or, or at least that's what people might say. Um, mm. I think, I think it's, it's very different to think about how your lived experience changes once you try something. Mm -hmm. And even if you get it wrong, even if you misunderstand the entire concept, um, if you can take new actions that you couldn't take before, uh, yes, there might be consequences of, of having a naive understanding, but um, it's, it's worth the experience, I think, in most cases, to try these tools out and to not... Frankly, the, the most important thing is to not get mired down in others' expertise about these tools. Um, there are plenty of people who just like to be intellectual and just like to be the smartest person in the room. And that's fine for them. But I think it often does get in the way of our learning. So um, I think learning should be a thing to do that can be done safely and can be done also um, without feeling uh, the inferiority of not having all the answers right away. Definitely, definitely. Uh, we, I think we learn this stuff by using it and by doing things with it. And uh, <clears throat> also by having something that we care about to use it with. You know, we have some yeah. project or so on that we care about and we want it to succeed. And that seems to be uh, the conditions <laughs> for the consequences of learning. <laughs> yeah. Great, well, well thank thanks you. for your time, Ben. Um, <laughs> thank you for hosting me on, on my podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fun. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I'm glad you're sharing this with the world. I'm, I'm grateful you proposed the idea. I think um, this has been fun. And if, if one person uh, finds something new to try and go learn about, um, that's, I'll be so happy. Amazing, amazing.